and thanks for tuning into another episode of the our form scan sorry on irishracing.com looking forward to a brilliant oaks and derby weekend at epsom and, and i'm delighted to be joined by tanya stevenson to so look forward to the action tanya are you excited for the, for the big two days at epsom how can you not be? Because each year it throws up a, a different conundrum. And I think uh, 2024 has thrown up the trickiest yet. <laughs> trickiest yet, because it's uh, very far, hard to find a favourite for the derby. Uh, it's got a really complicated Coronation Cup to unpick. And then we have a excellent and exciting Oaks as well. Another tricky puzzle. Yeah, for sure. And I think we'll, 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 we'll go straight into it. You mentioned the Coronation Cup. And I think that's the first race, race we're going to look at on the Friday. We'll get it up on screen here. Um, and obviously, short price favourite in here, Emily Opjohn, who's been a massive performance to land this last year, beating Westover. Look, she's even won you, Tanya, and the rain is coming. Is it a worry for you um, seeing the forecast at Epsom? It's always a worry with Epsom because you don't know what that course is going to throw up. As much as anything, we've got to keep an eye out how the configuration of the course is uh, going to be. Andrew Cooper is obviously going to um, protect some ground for the derby itself. And sometimes when it rains too much, at the moment it's just good to soft. I think um, at the time of chatting, we're good to soft. But we've got some really heavy rain forecasts, may or may not. And then they run up. The stand side, which adds a whole new predicament. Yes, everything that um, is thrown at these horses, something has to be considered. And I don't think there's a, a pace angle really into the race. So it could be run at a race that we see why Pascal Barry has entered a horse because it could be run where there's a sudden belief of a surge in the last two furlongs, which could suit French Raiders that have done extremely well. I think they've had something like 21 winners in this race. So Emily Upjohn, yes, she's got to defend her crown. Triptyque did it a long, long time ago um, as a mayor. Let's see if Emily Upjohn can do it. Her form stands up, doesn't it? Yeah, I suppose she disappointed in Maidan, um, which was a little bit of a worry, um, beat my Rebels romance. But I suppose coming back as a five-year-old mare, there might be slight question marks about her. I think she'll have to settle to to, to see at home on what's likely to be soft ground. Like you mentioned, there's plenty of rain forecast. I thought Luxembourg, maybe he could get a soft enough lead in this one. Like you said, there isn't much of a pace angle in it. He can go forward. He does handle soft ground as well. And he wins the champion stakes a couple of years ago on soft ground. Again, you have to kind of forgive him. A bit like Augusto Rodin, he disappointed in Maidan. And, but so Augusto Rodin last weekend, um, Aiden can get them back from that kind of run. Um, I think if he if he's back to near his best, I think he's a really really strong challenger to to um, Emily Opjohn here. Um, what, what do you think of his chances? Um, he hasn't won since the Tattersall's Gold Cup last year, but you have to give him some forgiveness because um, as he goes into this race, he's been some running some mighty seconds in some really strong group run work races like the Irish Champion, for example. Um, he, yes, of course, all of the runners have got to have a chance if you read them in certain circumstances. If he goes forward, then does he lend himself then to those to stack up behind um emily upjohn i didn't think ran that bad because that rebels romance line of form has worked out really well now obviously the japanese horses haven't come out since um but the form obviously rebels romance has since and gone on one really well at uh, in hong kong so i'm not too phased about her i'm phased as you say a little bit about the ground um luxembourg i I do appreciate what a quality for performer he is. Uh, the the Hamish um, uh, t connections we do rain dances. <laughs> they can't have it. They will not have it soft enough. Um, Hamish and he seems to flow into a race. I don't think he'd be a horse that will need the pace. And if they don't go with the pace, he'll just kick on and say, "Well, come and get me." He's only well, group one was against Kiprios, so there is the injection of stamina and some. So that's why I think that if he senses um, that there's no pace in the race, they'll kick him on from Tattenham Corner and say, "If it is that soft." Yeah, I thought he was actually really interesting. Um, Ten to one looks a pretty big price about him. Like you kind of mentioned, he's kind of playing his trade, I suppose, mostly in group two and group three level. But he hasn't actually got an awful lot to find on official ratings with the top two in the market. Like you said, the rain will suit him very, very well. He's remarkably consistent. He's very rarely out of the first two if you go through his four lines. Um, 
if the rain comes, I can see him going out a lot shorter on the day. So I think 10 to 1 about Hamish doesn't look a bad price at all in what looks like a really interesting contest to open up. The, our, our card, I suppose, on Oaks Day, but we'll have a look at the 345 now. It's the Betfred Nifty 50 Handicap. Um, interesting race. I think it's around five to one city streak here for Andrew Balding and Oshin Murphy. Five to one bolster for Kyle Burke. Six to one, another one for Kyle Burke. There, Liberty Lean. He had a great weekend last week, and I suppose landing two guineas. The the German and the Irish within um I think forty five minutes. So got a strong hand in this one again, but it looks like a tricky contest. Um, Tanya. Yeah, a city streak sits towards the top of the market. Um, I felt the the win at Chester. He never looked comfortable going forever and ever around the turns. So the legs kept changing. Despite that, he's, he's done incredibly well to win the race. But then the, your next examination is to go to Epsom. And just, you know, even with the uh, course being a little bit, the width being uh, less and coming around that fight, I think it might be a l- tricky a city streak um there, there's just the configuration of the course might count against him you've also for me you've got to look to the pace of this and bolster made all for his victory um and he might be asked to do the same now whatever ground at epsom to try and make all there is very very tricky unless you've got a little bit in hand or you know your horse is improving but Pol- bolster is the pace angle he will be terrorized bless him i sense by killybeg's warrior who comes into the race, uh, he he hated that race. He was in the City Street race and, oh dear, I don't know what happened to him, come seventh of seven. But he is a touch of, he got a touch of class in his handicap. He won a lovely handicap last year at Newmarket over this trip. But he will bother Bolster if Bolster goes out in, in front and he can run off the back of him because he stays that little bit further. He's in his time, he, he's running a Dante and that, that gives you an idea of his class. But I don't know what to think of his last run. King's Code is a lovely horse. He, he's a definite Epsom horse because he, he runs well two or three back from the front runners and he could just run off the back of them. Um, but you can help me here. Big time help me here. You can tell me how good that run at Nace was for Derry Lad. Um, yeah, he, he was really, really <laughs> eye-catching that day, wasn't he? And he's, yeah. <laughs> his, his trainer, Kevin Coleman, um, he's a he's a shrewd operator. Having Haley Turner booked here as well as eye-catching, yeah. I think he was probably my selection in here on yes. one. You mentioned that run. Was it Nace or, was it Nace or Nav? And it was it Nace? It was, some, was, no, it, no, so it, was it, it, it was just... Well, I had to keep watching it um, two or three times thinking, are these the colours? These are the colours because I recognise him because they run so well, Dory Lad, in the Sunday series. So there's no issue of coping with different tracks. He coped at Ponty, uh, Ponty Fracton. He's coped with Hamilton. And he's been to Epsom before. This is the great thing. He ran in 2022 in September in the Jump Jockeys Derby. He was a short price favourite for him, but no one could account for how much rain they were going to get and no one could account for how deep and heavy it was going to be. It is going to be soft, which is going to suit him. And that race, that run last time, told you his well-being. And seeing as I've pointed out so much pace with Bolster and Killy Beggs Warrior, uh, I said Haley will, will, will find it handy to try and find the ideal position to put him in to give him that ability to have that run. Yeah, for sure. He he's my selection. He was shopping back to Moyle as well last time in Nice. Stepping back up to the ten probably looks like more like his trip. Um, yeah, I think he could be really dangerous here. Even watching him crossing the line in Nice that day, it looked like it took him an awful long time to yeah. pull up after the line. So um, wouldn't be surprised to see him cherry ripe here. So yeah, Derry Lad there, a really dangerous Irish challenger, I think, in the Nifty Fifty handicap. But we'll go on to the four thirty then. Obviously, the big one of the day on the Friday, the Oaks. Um, you kind of alluded to earlier with the cracking renewal this year, I think. Ylang Ylang, obviously, in here. I think two to one favour for Aidan O'Brien and Ryan Moore after a brilliant one in the Guineas. They also have Ruby's R Red, of course, a sister to found in here, nine to two under Wayne Lord. And the Dermot well trained Azalea, a really interesting one, I think, around nine to two. But um, you can make cases for a lot of these, I think, Tanya. Um, what's your opinion on the Oaks? We've only got one group one runner in the race in Ylang Lang, uh, a brilliant winner of the Phillips Mile. And as we all think, it was a brilliant Oaks trial. Um, if you watch her on both runs at Newmarket, she never lets herself down. She has her head held high. 
Um, and it's strange to think that you would feel over in a steadier pace over a track like Epsom, she might relax a lot, lot more. She never seemed to relax in the Phillies mile until the last half of Furlong. In the Guineas, luckily for her, they seemed to be going that much faster, which enabled her to suddenly get into a stride. But it became apparent that for her, a mile was uh, too short. Um <laughs> Rubies are red. I don't know really what to say about that. Uh, that was a brilliant run in the Lingfield Oaks trial, uh, an Oaks trial that's thrown up Annapura in recent years, which you got me won the race. And that was excellent uh, fractionals guessed by um, Hector Crouch as he swung round at Lingfield. He seems to bit. He seemed to build up the momentum and build up gaining a half a length with every stride as they went uphill, which is the thing you got to try and do at Epsom because uh, the configuration at Epsom and Lingfield have got a little bit similar except coming into the home straight you haven't got the camera at Lingfield but the way that he built up the pace meant that Rubies of Red lost the ground on on her so but then when they came down the home straight <laughs> it, 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 it exposed how green treasure was hmm. she was ex uh, extremely extremely green you got me was um, just kept kept going until the petrol luckily ran out just after the line and rubies are red goodness me needs all of the uh mile and a half so that's the lingfield um oaks trial and, that, and that, that's a great pointer so aiden could have a one two he's done that before he's had a one two before he's had won lots of oaks so has Ra rafe beckett he's had a one two when talent beats secret gesture and he's got plenty of runners in the race yeah, he is. Was it three or four for Rafe Beckett in here? I yeah, thought four, Paris yeah. Ferry was a really yeah. interesting one in here as well. That seven to one looks a pretty fair price about her. I was I was actually really impressed by her win in Chester when she got the better of Port Ferry. She really kind of just got going late on that day. Um, she's by wall guess. I don't think the rain's going to bother her at all. I think there's plenty of um form on soft ground in the pedigree. I think there's probably a lot playing in her favour. She liked the trip. Um, are you a fan of hers, Henya? Um. I I, I'm, I'm fortunately I'm biased and looking a little bit elsewhere, but um, her Chesh, uh, Cheshire Oaks run, of course, um, Nabel was the last one to do the Cheshire Oaks and the um, Oaks double. A uh, Forest Ferry won it tough as a grinding performance, um, and is another one that will be suited by a much longer straight to run home down or and, um, obviously build up and then swing round. Forest Ferry will be suited. Seawood won't go away that easily. One of the big outsiders uh, for Wraith in the races, as proved in the Cheshire Oaks itself. It, um, Forest Ferry does come in here with credit and you've got to be in consideration but I'm certainly looking a little bit elsewhere rather than Forest Ferry. Yeah I'm, I'm probably in the rubies or red camp here like you mentioned her um look I suppose a rating in 97 she's probably not the most flashy one if you're looking for an Oaks winner but I think she has an awful awful lot to improve on even hearing the way Aiden kind of speaks about her in the last couple of weeks um I think he always calls her found sister so <laughs> they, I think they kind of uh they mark that to her but um I think she can come on an awful lot would you be worried at all about the track at Epsom for her though um I know some people are maybe cribbing she maybe got a little bit unbalanced at Linkfield last time um, would you have any worries that kind of way for No, because um, had they have gone to a York as a trial or a Chester as a trial, they wouldn't have known the um, vulnerabilities. They've gone to Lingfield so they can rectify what they believe that could be any issues. Um, I think having gone to Lingfield and getting everything went completely wrong because at one point it was so far behind uh, you got me Um he just you couldn't believe that the amount of ground was going to be uh, reduced in that manner and it was an excellent template or a, a learning curve to come to Epsom with so it was a big thumbs up for me having gone to Lingfield. Yeah for sure I, I'm in her camp with I think she was around eight to one after after that run in Lingfield but she's obviously a lot shorter here nine to two but I think it is justified and I think kind of like you mentioned Ryan wrote her in Lingfield that day I think if he thought there was real issues around Epsom they probably just wouldn't be coming here just to even mention to the Dermot Weld Azalea yes um, she, yeah, she, 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 she look she was very very good I thought she outstayed Purple Lily winning in Navin over the 10 furlongs Purple Lily ran a very credible race I think last weekend in the um, Irish 1000 guineas um look Dubarry has his record in Epsom classics obviously looks probably 
has obviously has a very strong chance of breaking that duct. But um, there's a few question marks about her for me. Um, what do you think of her run so far? Um, on that day that she ran in the South Bill, I felt so sorry for Billy Lee. <laughs> it's Derek <laughs> Brogue, um on Purple Lily at just at the wrong point because we'll never know exactly what would happen. But what we do know with um, the Derbert Well filly is her relatives, which are Estimate and Enzeli, which were two uh, superb stays. So there's going to be no issues with stamina. And it's another case of Chris Hayes deciding when to go because he can't go at the last minute because she is, you can watch with, you can actually see um, what he did in uh, the race against Purple Lady. He he started to, had, had to start to push her from about three furlongs out. She's that sort of, I think that you'd be ver finding it very hard to keep her out the first three because of her stamina uh, she does look incredibly tough um and she looks as though she has an immense touch of class but she she's got a lot to learn because she does look like um her relatives in the way that she runs she's going to be under pressure and people are going to be worried about her as she comes around Tatnam corner because chris i sense will be pushing her starting to push her then but that's her she she's a beautiful staying type yeah, she, look, she, she's sure to run a big race and Darren Well definitely knows how to get them ready um, for, for the big day. But I think some big thumbs up there for Ruby's Red. Question marks for me and maybe slightly from Tanya around Yelang Yelang. I think she'll have to settle a little bit better here. I'm probably not the biggest fan of her. She can be a little bit in and out. Um, And just listening to how Yaden speaks around Opera Singer, he said Opera Singer was an awful way ahead of Yelang Yelang. Um, in a couple of stable tours and I wouldn't be surprised to see Rubies or Red maybe progress past her at this trip anyway in particular. I know she kind of looked like she probably wanted a trip in the guineas but um, I would have question marks about her seeing it on, on the likely so softening ground at Epsom. So we'll go on to uh, Saturday's racing I think just to have a look at um, a couple of races before the Derby and we'll obviously get on to the big one then. I think the first race we'll have a look at is the two o'clock. It's the Princess Elizabeth Stakes just got the declarations true this morning recording on Thursday morning. Um, Looking at just a quick look at the betting here, and it's running line seven to four favourites. Obviously, look, I kind of ran in a similar contest last time, I think, for John Gaz and Lushy Murphy. I, I I felt a bit sorry for her that day. She was left out in front an awful long way from home and just got maybe lacking concentration, got collared a bit. Um, I can see why she's a seven to four favourite here. I think she could be tough enough to beat. Um, did you have an opinion on this one, Tanya? Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. I mean, I'm glad the running line's in the race, so hopefully. Um, make the odds for the, the couple of that I really like in this race. I'll be looking for a little bit of value on Sparks Fly, who was a superstar winning eight races uh, last season. And um, she was a revelation then. She's not now. Everyone knows how good Sparks Fly is. And I was so, so pleased by her reappearance where she came um, behind a horse that you all know really, really well in Earl's um, of... Uh, Gavin Cromwell's. Now she conceded chunks and chunks of weight and she was only beaten three lengths. Uh, this is a different proposition. Finally, she's um, getting up to uh, a group three, so fair play to her. And she's only got to give weight to a couple in this race. She's going to improve for that run, which is great. Now the one, the one danger of this race to everyone, because it is unknown, she's unknown and she she could be well she's already a superstar i'm guessing so it's called glimpsed tried by wraith um now glimpsed has some really nice family members in reg regarde who won the uh dubai duty free and scope who won a group one in france in a staying trip now at uh, last season, she just was green as grass. She did just uh, she ran some nice races, a couple of nice races, um, and she just oozed talent. Now, last time out at York in a listed race called the Michael Seeley, she was totally ignored, and yet I think it was Holly on board there at that time. Holly Dot ran an absolute belter, and she started to stay on and only got beat three lengths. She looks to me, knowing that the family and as Rafe does, he would have earmarked this race. And she, being a three-year-old, gets a massive uh, weight advantage. She'll be, for me, the selection with uh, Miss Saber on Sparks Fly. 
but she she'll start to get going. Look out, everyone! In the last furlong and a half or so, I think the camber will, might help her. But once again, the, the camber won't be severe because I'm guessing the the course will be the width will be re reduced because one the ground and two protecting it for Derby Day. Very good, a nice mm -hmm. twenty to one shout in there. I was actually that can't be that. That. that's huge. <laughs> She's huge. But... <laughs> we all get on, and he probably no, won't. No, 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 no. <laughs> she, she probably won't be half the price on the day. <laughs> we'll go on to the two thirty-five after a big selection yeah. there from Tanya Glimpsed. The two thirty-five. It's the Di Dio made stakes. I'm not sure if my friends yeah. that right, but we'll go, we'll go with that. Yeah. Um, and early market leaders here up the top there, Highland Avenue, seven to two. Charlie Appleby, he's been flying his trade in Maidan throughout the winter. And then Besto, I thought was maybe one of the more unexposed types in the field for Roger Varian in there at seven to two as well. Regal Reality, four to one for Sir Michael Stout and Ryan Moore, one of the elder statesmen in the field, I suppose, a nine year old, but he's a solid performer. Um, what's your thoughts on this one, Tanya? It's a rematch from last year with Highland Avenue and Regal Reality. It's a case of uh, whether you think it's going to be Regal Reality winning again this year or whether you think that they'll hold Highland Avenue up a little bit later. Um, Regal Reality ran a, a nice con nice run in the uh, Earl of Sefton and then I don't know what happened to it in the stalls next time up behind Stable Companion Passenger but was left a about three lengths behind the remaining runners as soon as it come out the stalls and once again ran a nice race there um he this this is his race for the reality he tends to kind of go up a little, little bit in level but uh each year um he he runs well in these kind of races i sense it's going to be a forecast again it's whether how they play highland avenue because if you watch the replay you can't miss him beautiful beautiful gray gray horse it's how they'll play him whether they'll wait they'll they'll try and find some pace to wait behind i'll stick with sir michael stout's runner sir michael stout's having a, a good season so far six winners from his last uh, 21 runners um, and he's won this race, obviously, with Regal Reality, but um, a, a, quite a few times in the past. So he's um, had this in mind with those two runs at both uh, the Earl of Sefton and the Chester Contest. Yeah, I, I probably marginally wish there's never a very strong opinion on this one, but I thought it was on top of all the points for me there, probably noteworthy. He's the only rise that Ryan Moore takes on Derby Day, apart from City of Troy, of course, later on in the cards. So um getting a nice feeler of the of the course and hopefully a winner along the way as well. So we'll go on to I think we're gonna skip this three ten just to save a little bit of time. We'll go on to the three forty five of course, the dash the race before the Derby and um <laughs> I suppose as always a tricky looking contest. But we've got five to one Fairden House there top of the weights. Um 11 to 2 Silky Wilkie, who was second in this race last year. 6 to 1 Lucky for Linda. 7 to 1 Democracy Dilemma. I thought Silky Wilkie was probably an eye catching one in here. It's got the cheek pieces on first time. I think 11 pounds lower than when second in this last year, which um, I suppose is eye catching on its own. Um, what's your thoughts on this one, Tanya? Yeah, he um, routed them not so long ago when he won a Scottish Sprint Cup. Um, and as you said, he was second just ahead of Clarendon House in this last year. The weight differential um, is enormous. But if they, they, I think there's a belief that Clarendon House, or there's a hope and a dream that Clarendon House might run in the Nunthorpe this year. And if that is the case, then he's going to put up another brilliant performance, a bold performance like he did when beating Looking for Linda at York. Um, just a couple of weeks ago. Uh, he was just a nose behind Silky Wilkie who picked him up um, Epsom last year. Uh, so they're the big two in the race. There's, I think there's only 15, isn't there, in the dash this yeah, year, no. which um, doesn't sort of uh, make you think that they're going to fan right across the course like they normally do, that there's generally traffic problems in this contest. There's unlucky stories. So I want to be with... Uh, one that it runs up with the pace. I can't believe that they haven't run Dream Composer at Epsom until now. Obviously, there's not many meetings at Epsom, but Dream Composer is a horse in this race who has done brilliantly at Goodwood. So said nine runs at Goodwood, one twice, and a further five places. A, a horse that has gone up gradually in the ratings, which is um, perfect. And uh, he, he races in contention. And last um, week, he ran about, 
I think it was eight days ago, in fact, he ran behind Fair Wind. Well, he sort of seemed to, uh, he hit the front and then Fair Wind came past him and then he went with Fair Wind again at Goodwood. Goodwood and Epsom have their similarities for the five furlongers uh, trip. They they really stand out and that's why Dream Composer could be a danger to all, offer really, really no way because of his mark. He um, he could get in a mix in between Silky Wilkie and Clarendon House just because of the style of his running. And Joe Levy's going to have a real thrill pin on board him. And, um, and that'll help as well. That will help as well, get more weight off the saddle. Um, so, yeah, I mean, for me, it's a three horse race Silky Wilkie, Clarendon House, and Dream Composer. And the fact that finally we've got Dream Composer at Epsom, I'm going to stick with that one. Big. Because the the price probably would be there for a little bit of value, but yes, I do appreciate the other two, especially Silky Wilky with the weight. There's going to be big dangers. <laughs> so yeah. Silky Wilky for me, and uh, Tanya's going for the bigger price. Dream composer, and what's hopefully a tree horse race, <laughs> like you yes. summarised, twelve to one wouldn't be too bad, even no. for the East Ray places. Just in this type of race, um, how important do you think the draw is at Epsom? You want to be drawn, I suppose, in among the piece. You yeah you want to be drawn in yeah that that's because the the course is going to be uh, that much truncated the draw uh, I mean many people will say it will pounce on the fact and say the draw is significant getting a clear run is significant mm -hmm. because sometimes they will bunch up and they'll bunch up to the stand side rail and as you saw by uh, Silky Wilkie last year. It was kind of a case if I, if only, and there was a couple of others in the race that just never got the run, and it wouldn't have mattered. Yeah, you cannot like predict where they're going to bunch up. So um, perhaps you want to be drawn more to the middle. You want to be just sat in behind the pace. Otherwise, if you're on this stand side rail, you you're going to find it very hard. Unless you're a leader, you, you're going to find it hard to come through. Very good. So. Yeah, you're, you are. I'm with Silky Wilkie and Dream Composer, 12 to 1, 11 to 2. Hopefully, we'll be up there in and among them anyway. We'll go on to the big one, of course. I suppose the one we're all building up to the Epsom Derby. Um, look, plenty of talk around this favourite city of Troy. I think the hype was justified given his two year old campaign, but he blew out big time in the Guineas. Um, Aiden has been really, really bullish since, which is maybe swaying me back onto the city of Troy train slightly, but. He's very, very hard to back, I think, at around seven to two. I suppose just to start off with the favourite, Tanya, um, what's your summary of him? Um, obviously, the Guineas run is a mass worry. He was the phenomenon of 2023, and we can't deny that. Um, he he was a superstar in his own right, and we're all deflated by what happened in the Guineas, but that was a run too bad to be true. And had August and Rodan's um, not happened last year, having not run well in the Guineas and then he showed his might in the Derby, we would not even be contemplating City of Troy. Uh, not certainly towards the top of the market anyway. He would still be in here and we'd be saying the what is. Uh, an extra ingredient has been thrown in because they've done the draw for the Derby and he's got uh, store one which has made him edge out a little bit in the market because um, Adaya was drawn store one and I think one other since 1973 have won out of store one, which is something else to count against him. Um, but then how will he be run this time? How will he be ridden, uh, City of Troy, from store one? So, yes, I appreciate he's a phenomenon, but I'm going to step back from him uh, because he, he ran so poor and we'll just, uh, I think we said off camera, we'll just have to make up another superlative if uh, Aiden <laughs> gets his city of, uh, he improves City of Troy again after that uh, Guineas run. Yeah, I suppose even like even if he had won the Guineas, there, I think there probably still would be question marks about stamina over this kind of trip. He was such a fast two-year-old. Aiden doesn't seem to have any worries about that um, and recent stable tours, he kind of, thought that any, any trip might be okay for him but I'm happy enough to leave him on at that price and um, with those question marks about him I think we both kind of um were fans of Los Angeles um he's a really kind of impressive physical horse obviously group one winner as a two-year-old which may be a little bit forgotten about was a good winner I think obvious derby trial at Leopardstown but he probably will have to step forward on it again um you're a fan of him Tanya 
massively so. I've watched him a few times of that that same race again, the Leatherstown Derby trial again and again, and he's just a baby. He's got n- no real, he hasn't computed yet what he's meant to do. And he's just been cajoled into the race and he's going to be having to learn very quickly when you go to um, Epsom. Yes, he's a, he's a big, big boy. Um, uh, but I have no fears with him at um, Epsom. I just had more fears of his inexperience and his ability to pick up soon enough. I wondered whether he might, on watching him at Lebsam, he seemed to have hit a flat spot for two or three strides, but that might be inexperience. And then suddenly he thought, oh, this is what I'm meant to do. And he ran on. But he, he's um, he's a really likeable type. And He's a type that you're already thinking autumn, winter, looking at him because he seems too raw now. Seems very raw at the moment still. He does look raw. And like you said, um, I, even just watching the, uh, I think Kuhn Moore put out a couple of videos of him galloping and seeing him in comparison to City of Troy, he's a totally different beast altogether. Um, mm. I think he will have to improve in the Leprestown one. But like you said, he's the type of horse who probably should improve for it. Um, just looking at a couple of the others, ambient play friendly, Obviously, a very good winner of his Derby trail. Maybe looks a little bit friendless in the market there, six to one. He's easy enough to back. Um, obviously, jockey changed a lot of publicity around that. Uh, Callum Shepherd jacked off for uh, Rab Hafflin. Are you a fan of his, Tanya? Um, they're worried, I think, about how soft the ground will be with Ambiente Friendly. Uh, one of a good run to watch of him was when he um, finished, I think, fourth in the field and stakes, the run before he won the, and that shows you uh, the way that he was starting to improve. And then you watch the Lingfield run, and that was just sensational. But that was a Lingfield run on good ground, really quick ground, and they just worried. I sense that a little bit of soft ground might not show the. Um, sort of speed and dexterity that he did uh he comes in here with obviously running a one of the trials and winning very very easily uh james fanshaw is very relaxed about it his last run in this race was environment friend back in 1991 and i think for him this is um uh, yeah just just something uh, he can come come at it in a much more relaxed perspective, and yes, he'll get get the the uh, t- tingles about it. But ambient friendly it comes in here with a live chance, providing it doesn't rain too much for him. Yeah, I'm sure he'd be a lot more relaxed than needing no rain on the morning yes. anyway. <laughs> yes. One who the rain might bring in Ted slightly at a very big price. That a star might be slightly forgotten about. Bally Sachs winner course on heavy ground, I think, in Leopardstown earlier on the year. Mm. Look, I don't think the form was boosted too much from that. I suppose Illinois was second to Ambiente friendly. But he kind of routed the field that day. I suppose Jamie Heffernan gave him a really good ride. And those ammo horses can be ready really early on. But if an awful lot of rain falls, it might just drag him into the pitcher a small bit. And we were talking off air a small bit as well. Um, kind of looking towards those outsiders and who, who you might pick out. You did mention Voyage. I was mm. looking at him as well this morning myself. Like, I suppose on breeding. By a Derby winner out of Galileo Mayor, um, he should be well up to the task. I thought he was really impressive winning in Newbury as well. It's a, it's a massive ask coming in here on only mm. one run. But um, what did you make of that reappearance from him? I know Richard Hannon has been talking fairly favor- favorably about him. Yes, Lamtara did it in the fact that he won on seasonal debut. Um, but this is a little bit different. Voyage has just had one run. Um, <laughs> Goodness me. Uh, and it was, it's was it been in a maiden at Newbury, but he won that maiden as if he was going down to the start. Mm. It was that breathtaking. And he looks a bit like Los Angeles in a big war um, unit. And Richard Hannon wouldn't leave him in there lightly. Uh, he's not got the best of uh, the draws, but I don't think really I'd be too worried. I'd be more worried if he was drawn on one, two or three. I think he's on the the wide outside. I think he might be something like 16 or that. That in a way is a little bit helpful. Pat Do- Dobbs, I think, is on board. He can make it, the mind up of where he wants to uh, position him. I think he'll position him mid-division. Um, but we don't know. He's out of Golden Horn, so he ought to, as a turn for home he ought to have plenty of stamina be able to have a finishing kick and that's the beauty of it we just don't know how good he is Dallas Star is handy 
because he can come in here as if um, as a rank outsider. And the way that he won the Bally Sacks, he could be up there to the fore. He could set the pace here and they could say, well, this is handy. Everyone's looking over everyone else's shoulder thinking, who leave. we'll go for it. We'll try and do um, a serpentine in the fact that we'll lead and we'll just come around turn and we'll just kick on and we'll see if we can hold on. They've got... Um, and I've got that and Mr. Hampstead, but Dallas Star it was totally underestimates. You say he was 50 to 1 when winning the Ballysack Stakes. Couldn't believe that. Won it very easily. You say the form wasn't franked, but you've just got to try in your mind and think who's going to lead, uh, where's the pace, and how are they going to position themselves? And the, I, I'm liking the unknown. I'm liking Voyage because um, the Hannons have been very quiet and yet they've spoken loudly in their actions in the fact that the manner that they won the um, Irish 2000 guineas with the 1-2 there. So they'll know the ability of Voyage because there are plenty of uh, top-class horses to work in with. Um, and then if there's another name to throw out, it's Dancing Gemini. Um, what a thrill for Dylan Brown McGonagall to be riding Dancing Gemini in the race after running so so well in the French Thousand Guineas, um, he took our breath away. The horse uh, last year before he ran in the uh, big Group One, we thought there were big things to come, um, and he ran well enough uh, in the Donny Group One. But uh, he's just well, he's gone out of all uh, content. You know, all our thoughts with that brilliant run in France. So he's got to be considered. He's got the uh, pedigree, I think, to come into this, and he's. He's a different proposition, whereas we've got Los Angeles who will grind it out. Um, we've got uh, Dallas Star, he'll probably try and make all. We've got the likes of, um, you know, the one we mentioned, Voyage. He's got the potent finishing kick. So if he's travelling well with about a foot and a half to go, we're going to all worry <laughs> if we pick something else because he's got that acceleration. If you can run in those French thousand guineas and reduce the deficit like he did, um, no wonder Dylan Brown McGonagall is saying I won't want to swap him for anything else. Um, he's got what most of the others haven't got, um, really yeah. short space of time acceleration. Definitely an interesting contender and probably one who is being overlooked a bit. Um, I haven't mm. seen him being mentioned too much and great to see Dylan Brown getting his first ride, obviously one of the top riders here in Ireland. But I think to summarise, I think we're both pretty big fans of Los Angeles, yeah. liking the unknown and voyage. And yeah. I think maybe that, that a star if a lot of rain falls, I might have a small bet on him in 33 to 1. Um, if he goes out in front, you know, never know, he might stay there like Serpentine, like you mentioned. <laughs> but I think that's a pretty good analysis of the Derby. Thanks for that, Tan. Um, I think we're both kind of looking towards the Aiden O'Brien Los Angeles second string who might be able to topple um, the bigger name in City of Troy but I think we'll wrap it up here we've gone through kind of most of the main action over the two days at Epsom but before we finish up I'll ask you for a nap and a next best over the two days over the two days well why not have a nap in um, glimpsed in that uh Princess uh, Elizabeth Stakes, that is, uh, she's a big price, but she's going to be a superstar of the future if she isn't already. It's because of all of her family members and the way she ran. Um, and the next best will be a little bit of an each way on dream composer uh, in the uh, dash. That, that, you know, she, okay. he, he's got a, finally a run at Epsom with a, a good Goodwood record. Some nice prices in there as well. I'm going to nap up the Irish horse on the own. A little bit predictable, maybe. Derry Ladd, I think, in the nifty 50 yes. handicap for Kevin Coleman. 8-1, to one, I think, looks a really fair price about him. And I think we both liked him as well in our preview of that. And my next best, I'm going to go Rubies are red in the Oaks. I think she could really step up on her form and um, announce herself as one of the top fiddies this year for Aidan O'Brien. But we'll wrap it up there. Thanks very much, Tanya, for all your contributions. Great analysis analysis of all of the big races over the two days. Um, anyone who listened, make sure to gamble responsibly over the, over the weekend at Epsom. And if you like the channel, make sure to like and subscribe.